Okay. Good morning and good day. My name is Steve Tui, VP of Product Marketing for Etly. I want to thank all of you for attending today's webinar, Five Steps to a Data Lake House That Works. Uh, your audio lines are going to be muted in listen-only mode, uh, but please do submit your questions to any of our panelists through the question and answer panel. Uh, we will open it up to dedicated Q&A time uh, at, the, at the end. Uh, so with no further ado, at this point, I'd like to introduce Christian Roming, CEO and founder of EventLeap, to get started. Christian. Thanks so much, Steve. You're welcome. My name is Christian, I'm the CEO of EventLeap, and uh, thank you for joining us today. We're very excited to have uh, Jeff Hirsch, Morningstar's Head of Core Data, and Alvin Huang uh, from the Capital Markets team at AWS. I'm going to take a few minutes first to talk about Etleap and the value our service provides, and then Alvin will give a short introduction to data architecture on AWS. The main part of today's webinar, though, is hearing a real-life example of building an effective uh, uh, data lake house and giving you the chance to learn from Morningstar's experience. If I can have the next slide, please. Etleap is a data integration platform. Uh, whether you opt for a data lake or a warehouse or a lake house, Etleap makes it easy to build data pipelines to get analytics ready data. And in Morningstar's case, it's about getting the data product ready as data is productized in their financial platform. Now, it's certainly possible to build and manage these data pipelines yourself on AWS. In fact, that's what I did before I founded Etleap. And as Jeff will tell you, Morningstar analyzed how they could do it in-house as well. That initial plan, though, included a group of ETL specialists building thousands of pipelines over multiple years, and that just wasn't practical for a market leader that depends on innovation and fast change. The fact is that most organizations shouldn't be in the process of writing code and building their own tools to create and manage data pipelines. Next slide, please. There's some uh, camera difficulties here, one moment. All right. Etleap can take data from any data source and ingest into your uh, cloud data lake or warehouse. And as you'll see, Morningstar's environment has a lake house consisting of an Amazon S3 plus glue data lake and an Amazon Redshift warehouse. Etleap is also tightly integrated with Snowflake as a data destination. Etleap provides uh, data transformations that both engineers and analysts can configure. There is an intuitive interface where users can wrangle data and also write SQL statements to model data within the lake or warehouse. Um, the product is tightly integrated with and also built on AWS services. That means that our customers don't need to worry about provisioning or scaling. Next slide, please. Ultimately, uh, we provide a platform that makes it easy to build and manage robust data pipelines for warehouses and lakes. And as Jeff will detail, Ethleap was able to cut multiple years and over 50% of the costs off of Morningstar's initial DIY integration plan. Finally, as an analyst-friendly tool, Ethleap helps organizations overcome the bottlenecks of a fully centralized data team, as Morningstar's journey will illustrate. And we see many of these patterns in particular with our financial services customers, and I hope that what Jeff shares with you today can help you in your journey. At this point, I'd like, it, uh, I'd like to hand it over to Alvin, who will discuss approaches to data architecture on AWS. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christian. Really appreciate it. Um, so what I hope to do over the next few minutes is really talk to you a little bit about the different approaches to modern data architecture that we've seen being implemented by financial services customers. Um, and this really includes, number one, a data lake architecture, number two, a lake house architecture, and then number three, a data mesh architecture. Now. At the core, all of these architectures have the same foundational or fundamental components that you see on this slide, right? Data collection, data ingestion, data storage, data analytics, and then overarching all of this is data governance. Now, some of the key considerations to keep in mind as you're building out your data architecture, right, are very much the same concepts that Christian spoke around, right? He spoke about uh, time to value. You want an environment that can handle the increasing volumes of data, as well as the different types of data, right? Both structured as well as unstructured data, and then be able to extract insights out of that data as quickly as possible. And to do this, you really uh, you know, want each component of this flow to be independently scalable, right? So if you have abnormally large uh, volume of data coming in uh, because of market volatility, 
you don't want the data ingest process to impact the data analytics workloads or vice versa. And lastly, Christian spoke about having self-service access to the data, right? So you want to make the data easily accessible, uh, discoverable, as well as shareable. Next slide, please. So the first architecture we'll talk about is the data lake, right? Which really allows you to store all of your data, structured, semi-structured, unstructured, at any scale. And you can bring this data into your data lake using uh, a number of different mechanisms, uh, including your traditional end-of-day batch processes, or what we're seeing more often now is really event-driven and real-time streaming processes. And once you have the data stored and cataloged in your S3 data lake, you then have a suite of analytics and machine learn learning capabilities that you can apply to your data. So this data lake architecture is really a foundational architecture, right? And what we'll see on the next two slides with the lake house approach, as well as the data mesh approach, is that these are variations of the data lake architecture. Next slide, please. So with the lake house approach, really what we're doing here is we're focusing on that analytics layer, right? Where most customers do a large part of their analytics on structured and semi-structured data using data warehouses like Amazon Redshift. Now, for those of you who aren't as familiar with Amazon Redshift, it's a petabyte scale data warehouse that allows you to do complex uh, SQL queries and complex analytics. And really the, here, the idea here, right, is to extend the capabilities of your data warehouse, right? So in this case of Amazon Redshift, out to other data stores so that you can use federated queries, right, to query data, not just in Amazon Redshift, but also other data stores like your data lake, such as Amazon S3, as well as operational databases like Amazon Aurora. So with a single query, you can bring data in from multiple data sources and leverage the computing power of Redshift for analytics. Now, one of the nice things here is that this allows you to keep a relatively small amount of data, right, in your data warehouse. Um, and then when you need to grab um, historical data, right, you can do, do this with a single query and grab it from multiple data sources. And Jeff will go into more detail about how Morningstar is leveraging their lake house approach. Next slide, please. Now, the last pattern I want to show you is the data mesh approach, right? Now, again, foundationally, the data mesh leverages the core concepts of a data lake. But the variation here is that instead of having one centralized data lake, each data producer that you see on the left would create and maintain their own data lake, right? So uh, to give you an example of a large global bank as an example, right? This bank may have multiple lines of businesses, um, including retail banking, investment banking, wealth management, and so on. Now, each of these line of businesses would represent a data producer in this, um, in this diagram. Right, um, and they would have their own data lake and they would be responsible for maintaining that data lake. So what the data mesh does is that it really pushes the governance of that data down to the individual lines of businesses, which makes sense, right? Because the individual lines of businesses know their data the best, they're best positioned to address any issues around lineage, quality, governance, et cetera. Now in the middle, you have a central data catalog and this is the different data sets published by the data producers. Um, and it's discoverable and made available to the data consumers on the right. And these data consumers could be teams like regulatory reporting, surveillance, data science, risk, and many others. So hopefully that gives you an overview of the different approaches to modern data architecture that we're seeing across financial services. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff, who'll talk about Morningstar's journey to the democratized Lakehouse architecture. Thanks, Alvin. Um, so what uh, Christian and Alvin just showed is essentially um, all the great tech underlying uh, um, the journey that that in the, the destination that we've uh, um, come to at this point. Um, so I appreciate those overviews. It's really awesome. It's great context, and um, all of that stuff kind of uh, is is the foundation for what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about uh, the, our journey to a democratized lake house. Um, starting with kind of giving you an introduction to Morningstar um, and some of our initial problems with integrating data, um, our creation of a data lake, the evolution of that into a lake house, and then finally um, scaling all of that through a democratized platform. So a little bit about me first. Uh, I'm a Gen Xer. Uh, I, um, I've uh, play, been playing video games since I was very young, starting with Atari. <laughs> And, uh, and, and latest with my children at Fortnite. Um, I've been dealing with computers uh, since the early 80s as well, 80s as well, starting with uh, Texas Instruments, tape drives, 
um, for for saving data uh, and telecommunications. I was um, I was uh, my first modem was a 300 baud modem. Uh, prior to the internet, I was a sysop on uh, on on VBSs, um, and I started programming uh, in my um, uh, seventh grade of of um, my middle school, and that was logo was the first thing I did, and then in high school. I, uh, I, I moved on to Pascal and Basic and, and C, um, and uh, and then my professional life. Uh, I graduated from Florida State University uh, with a degree in management information systems, uh, and I immediately took a job at uh, the CME um, and started working in their clearinghouse, their back office. Learned Java, um, moved to Oracle, and then Bank of America, and had really spent a majority of my time on the server side, uh, doing uh, data synapse grid, enterprise service buses. Um, uh, uh, and then lately into the data lake and, um, and, and this lake house. And I've got a little, um, cryptocurrency sign up there because that's, that's, I'm an enthusiast, uh, an enthusiast of, uh, of crypto right now. So that's just something else that I find enjoyable. Um, a little bit about Morningstar. Uh, so Morningstar is a data and research company. We kind of consider ourselves the, the original, uh, uh, FinTech, um, uh, OG FinTech, if you will. Um, and uh, uh, we started in 1984. Um, the, this is essentially kind of the, the original ecosystem um, of, of the customers that we served. Uh, so Morningstar has always been about empowering investor success. That's our mission. And investors and advisors and asset managers are the three main categories that we historically served. Investors are always number one, but you can see that there's a, um, a, a circular loop here. Um, and uh, you can't ignore the advisors and asset managers if you really want to deliver great outcomes for investors. Um, so, so we are we play in the whole mix. We originally started uh, before big data and maybe even before data. Um, these prints in 1984, um, uh, we, they were printing uh, booklets of mutual funds. Um, and so research and the people and the subject matter expertise of those people that really was the heart of, of Morningstar at the beginning. It wasn't, it wasn't a technology company, it was a research company, a financial company. And design is something that came uh, you know, very shortly after because you know, the goal of empowering investor success is to be able to translate complex financial topics into layman's terms. And so uh, you know, part of the challenge um, for the early researchers was how can we actually uh, present this information in an intuitive way? And the Morningstar style box is just one example of that. Um, if you look on prospectuses from Fidelity um, and, and other providers, you'll, you should see this, um, this style box, uh, which, which kind of rates value versus growth against large cap versus small cap um, and shows you where, where a fund resides. Um, but we've been using this and it's, been, it's almost been institutionalized itself as a, um, as a means of, of, of communicating this type of information. Um, so design has always um, also been at, at the at the crux of what Morningstar does. Uh, you know, we, we uh, lately we've been um, and, and not lately it's always been occurring, but um, it's accelerated certainly in the past decade. I would say where we've been doing a lot of acquisitions. These are three um, acquisitions that we've done in the last uh, you know seven to three years. So uh, PitchBook is a private equity platform. Um, that venture capitalists uh, use. DBRS is a um, credit agency, and Sustainalytics is our environment, social, and government uh, governance uh, um, ESG um, uh, uh, kind of uh, provider. So we're working with all of these companies, and, and as such, the asset managers, investors, and advisors, our customer base has grown um, to you know venture capitalists, as an example, and, and other um, uh, areas. Um, people that want these different lenses um, and, and views of the data. Um, so we're on, right now, well, uh, I should say prior to the downturn in the market, we had $11 billion market cap um, and, and we've been around for, for um, several decades. Uh, a little bit about Morningstar Data, which is the team that I'm on. Uh, what we do is we basically, uh, we're responsible for um, loading uh, all different sites, types of reference data. Um, so whether they're entities like companies or securities like Apple's, um, uh, uh, you know, stock, um, we are we're loading that data in, and then uh, we do a lot of um, uh, massaging of that data. So 
we will um, we'll create uh, um, performance metrics and 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 create uh, calculations um, that augment that data, and then we will ship that data up to um, our customers, whether it's through some sort of batch file-based distribution or APIs, um, and we also build products. Uh, for that that automate workflows for our customers. So we have a whole software development arm um, that's building uh, institutional products for advisors and asset managers and the like. And our team, uh, my team specifically within that data organization is, is Morningstar DNA, which is the, um, the, the kind of data lake and analytics. Um, uh, and so what we are doing is we, we've developed a platform where all of that information feeds into um, an analytics workspace uh, backed by Jupiter Lab, and folks can um, generate insights quickly through that, and then push that back down um, for for import into uh, you know this giant pyramid, and then all of those new insights propagate through the infrastructure, and you can generate new insights from those other insights, and once again, that's kind of a, um, a revolving, uh, never-ending loop of continuous improvement. So. Some of the problems, I'm, I'm just going to kind of dig down into some of our early problems, particularly with a lot of these acquisitions, and I'm going to use a product that uh, um, I, I, um, uh, I, uh, I, our team uh, kind of built uh, early on. It's Morningstar Data Catalyst. What this product does is it shows um, a, a, a organization's um, kind of a heat map of risk associated with holdings of their portfolios across branches so that they can basically uh, um, you know, analyze what, um, uh, you know, what branches might be uh, more risky than others and, and, and work to um, uh, uh, improve that and, and, and you know, decrease risk in what. So this is a, you know, a bird's eye view of an organization and the risk. And so you can see we had, in this particular example, we had six data sets that we were looking to import and aggregate uh, and, and present this information. Um, the issue that we had is that those six data sets were actually owned by three separate teams. And so the process that might be familiar with some of you um, uh, is, you know, our researchers, they are grabbing, uh, we are getting them manual extracts so that they can do proof of concepts on this data. And then uh, if the proof of concept proves to be valid, they move to a productionizing phase um, where, where we have to reach out to all of these different um, producers of data again and say, hey, those manual extracts, those one-offs you provided us, we need you to actually automate that and productionize it. Uh, and, and so that's another kind of touch point between all of them. And then we've got to make sure that that's working correctly. And then we go to move it to product um, and, and productionize it. In this particular case, when we were getting ready to deploy, we found out that one of the um, uh, sources that we were looking to get data from that was actually um, becoming a deprecated source and someone was recommending to go get the data from another location. Um, and that, so that basically restarts the whole process of, oh, can we get a manual extract for that location? Can we see how it compares to our other one and whatnot? So you can see that this is a very, um, you know, timely process. And, um, you know, the cost of building these research style prototypes, it was very high, let alone productionizing them. So our research team had to be judicious in, um, you know, the decisions that they made on, on what, what they think had legs, what they wanted to invest in. Um, so we didn't have the flexibility to kind of try it all. We had to be, we had to be very deliberate. So step one for us was, uh, was centralizing this data. And that's where we chose to move into um, uh, Amazon's data lake infrastructure. Um, and as mentioned already, uh, data lake is a centralized repository of structured and unstructured data. Um, and we use it for storing and cataloging our data. Um, the idea of a data lake is there should be little upfront work to get it in, it's schema on read. Um, and, uh, and then as you're pulling it out, that's when you actually um, start uh, um, analyzing some of it. We took a, a slightly different approach where we did um, a, a bit more of cataloging and, um, and identification upfront, um, a, a, a bit more governance because we were concerned about it turning into uh, a data swamp, if you've heard that term. Um, so creating that uh, that central location actually, uh, you know, it, it removed the need for these point-to-point -point, um, relationships with all these different providers. Uh, we we have the ability to standardize the way in which we store the data, so that um, uh, you know, if one data, if you want to go back in time, uh, you know, the process for doing that for data set A is the same as data set B, um, and we allow the consumers of the data. 
um, to access it through uh, you know a, a common interface, which is essentially Data Lake and Athena and the other tools we built on that. And that automatically, um, that ultimately speeds up the time it takes them to get the data um, that they want. So this was great um, because uh, you know the, we built resilience around the data lake and all of this. So all of these bespoke integrations that we had and, and the operationalization of them, we centralized operational data lake and then everything kind of uh, got to take advantage of that. So we really st um, streamlined uh, the, the development process and the, and the prototyping process as a result of that. And we solved a lot of problems. Um, you know, uh, the um, uh, the huge data engineering requirement that I just spoke of um, was kind of removed, and and you know we had less data locations, um, you know, less time chasing colleagues, faster access to prototyping, that judiciousness that um, our researchers uh, um, previously had to to do in order to choose what they wanted to spend their time in. They actually. Don't, don't have to make those types of, of decisions now because the data is easily available. That said, um, there, were, um, there were still remaining challenges. Um, and a couple of those in particular was, uh, mo they were mostly on the consumer end. Um, so it's one thing to have a researcher just pull data and do some prototyping. But when you start looking to productionize this data and put it into products, um, you know, one of the big things that can happen is if you've got uh, duplicate data sources that are loading into the lake, then there's data ambiguity. Um, you know, you may have uh, a a a um, one um, one feed from uh, you know Sustainalytics that is pushing Apple data in, and and the ticker is AAPL, and you may have another um, a feed from uh, um, Equity, and they're pushing it in, and the ticker is um, APPL. Like one may be wrong by accident. Um, just this is an example. We would never do this, but <laughs> this is this is a, a basic example. Um, <clears throat> but in the case where they're not the same, you have to decide which one is right. Um, and so we want to make that decision uh, on behalf of the consumers because if we leave it up, if we leave the ambiguity there, then our products may make different decisions, and then you don't have data parity across the organization. So the idea was, how can we actually where there is ambiguity and we have multiple um, overlapping data sets in the lake, how do we decide kind of what is, what's, the, what's the right one that we want the consumers to use? What's the official one? And then the other remaining challenge was with querying speeds. Um, you know, S3 and Athena are good for prototyping, um, but because of the um, in, uh, undeterministic response times uh, and just some other attributes, it wouldn't be meant for, um, for, for uh, you know, um, industrial strength production um, uh, you know, operation. So we wanted to find something that we could query uh, our S3 with. Uh, we did a lot of um, analysis. We analysis we, we analyzed three different versions of Presto um, with different features uh, uh, that was not meeting our requirements. And ultimately, we found that Redshift was addressing the query speed that we needed. Um, so uh, that is what I would say is the step two in our in our process, which was making this data consumer friendly. Um, and the first part was loading a subset of that data from the lake into Redshift, um, which is the most uh, popular set of data that people care about, which is essentially the latest data. So the data lake holds all historical data. I talked about being able to go back and point in time and see things, but most people don't care about that historical data. They just wanna know what the market price is right now, as an example. So Redshift holds a subset of that, but it improves the querying speed dramatically. And then the other thing we wanted to do was address the data ambiguity, and that's something that Redshift uh, helped us uh, helps us with as well. So if you look below of, of the triangle diagram, uh, you know there's three core um, references that we want to keep a consolidated list of: entity, portfolio, and security down there. Um, and so you know taking these three um, these three references and actually applying modeling to them, um, uh, we are what we're doing is we're essentially creating views on top of materialized views, I should say, on top of the underlying ingredients from the data lake. And we are making those logical decisions in the view creation of which source is the, 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 um, the primary source. So in that AAPL versus APPL example, we would say, you know, more than likely our equity um, feed is the guaranteed source. Um, and if there's any discrepancy, we will always publish the equity feed. Um, and it may be wrong um, in, in the example I gave, but it'll be consistency, consistently wrong across all products. And from our perspective, that's an interest, a, a, a very uh, important 
uh, concept. Um, consistency uh, is arguably more valuable than accuracy um, because if you're uh, um, if you have inconsistency, no one even knows what what the situation is. If if you if you have consistency but it's wrong, it can be corrected and then it'll be consistently right. So um, so we are uh, we are trying to remove the inconsistencies and the data parities because that is, that that is a more challenging problem uh, in in our opinion. Um, and so we introduce this layer of decoupling where we create these views and we model them in a way that is friendly to the consumer and doesn't make them have to do any of that guessing work. And so this was essentially the lake house that we built on top of it. Um, that, that, that's what we refer to as the data lake house, which is essentially integrating a warehouse on top of our data lake. Now, you know, I talked about early on Morningstar, the, the, the the most powerful asset that Morningstar has is its people. Um, the research and the insights that they generate are second to none, and, and, and it is our bread and butter. And technology, you know, it's just a means of getting that, um, getting that out to people. So we are a people and research company first and foremost, and we use technology to, uh, you know, propagate that and, and, and bring it to the masses in a user-friendly way. But we are not a technology first company. We are a people and research company. The data is what matters. The Morningstar analysis, the um, fair market value, and uh, you know the current market data, this is what allows people to actually make the decisions that they need, and that is our bread and butter. So the question became, how do we actually take these, um, the, the, this great technology that we've built, and how do, we, how do we unleash our awesome people onto this? Um, because at, even with that technology, we had small, you know, small groups of developers building it out, and it was it was a, it was a centralized and and, and albeit painful process um, because of the amount of work that we had in front of us. And so something came to mind. We had a presentation around exponential thinking uh, at one of our annual offsites, which is known as Moats. Uh, and in this particular presentation, they they were um, they were talking about they used Wikipedia as an example. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Wiki, Wikipedia's start, uh, around 2000, it, it actually began, be, began as uh, newpedia.com. And they had 21 articles in year one, uh, which is not many. And a lot of the reason between that is because their, um, their, their model was they had a, a, a very lengthy review process by people, a, a very small subset of people that could do the actual reviewing. And, um, and so that became a bottleneck. Uh, for getting content onto the um, onto the onto Wikipedia, so they actually uh, you know had a very um, uh, you know a light bulb went off, and they're like, what if readers were editors, right? What if what if the people reading the content could actually edit the content? And just that simple kind of realization, uh, you know, made all the difference uh, in the world. You can see that um, you know there are six million plus articles and counting. Um, uh, you know, ever since they they made that that transition, so they went from I think they published 200 articles in the first month um, to 18,000 in the first year um, by basically or, or when they um, when they uh, when they moved to this readers or editors uh, uh, um, process. So the question was then, how do we actually take the concept of exponential um, thinking and how do we scale our people? And these are three areas where we looked to actually um, try and scale our people, um, data ingestion, data quality, and data modeling. And so these are three different um, you know, key aspects of our, of our workflow and our pipeline. Um, you know, and, and the issues that we have is with the data ingestion, you know, there are thousands of lines of ETL code to write. With data quality, the validation rule volume is unruly to manage. I mean, we have tens of thousands of tests that we plan on writing, um, and, and we've got 7,000 plus right now. Um, and so the sheer volume is an issue, but also the validation rules change. So, um, you know, if you think of a concept like negative interest rates or oil going negative, uh, you may have had um, uh, validation rules that say, you know, the price can't be less than zero, and then oil goes negative in COVID and your tests break. Well, the tests just need to be updated because reality has changed. Um, so it's not just a matter of validating that the data is correct, but also validating that tests are correct. And finally, with this data modeling, uh, you know, 
uh, we have thousands of views that, that we plan on creating with this data modeling. And we needed to find a way to um, kind of unleash our expertise there so that um, the people that are developing the methodology and the people that are developing the code, they're kind of working um, very tightly together as opposed to kind of this waterfally handoff that, that um, you know, most, um, mo most companies have, um, including ours in the past and other places I've worked with, have traditionally done. So I'll start with um, data ingestion, and, and these next three things are what I call the three big steps uh, um, to, uh, to self-service. Um, we began our journey with AWS Glue and Airflow, and there was a lot of complexity there, and those three little uh, individuals in the corner, um, it was one team, just developers working on that. We moved to leveraging AtLeap, which has a very slick UI. Um, that is uh, powered by um, uh, um, uh, AWS, as mentioned. And um, it allowed us to scale for ingestion in a lot of different ways. It created consistency with a simple UI. Uh, it allows our business SMEs to work directly with the data and not the code. And it allows any one of our team um, to log in and manage those respective pipelines. Uh, so it also provides a central reporting for operations to monitor the health of all those pipelines. So now we have all of these different types of users that can actually create pipelines, dev, developers, operations, BAs, DBAs, and it's federated across our product groups. So um, those teams from those various product groups can go in and, and manage their own pipelines. It's no longer just a central, a central um, uh, concept. So that's one great advantage of, of scaling our people. Um, the next one that I wanna talk about is uh, our data quality. Um, so, uh, you know, I mentioned how we, how we write tests. What we've done is we leverage JupyterLab and a product called Great Expectations, which is an open source framework um, written in Python uh, for doing validations. And we created a workflow um, uh, to basically write the tests, monitor the tests, um, and amend the tests as necessary. And so what happens is people will write tests in great expectations via JupyterLab, uh, and those tests can actually be published uh, to the environment and hit a CI CD pipeline that get pushed out and then get run as part of the Atleap pipeline. Um, Atleap has, um, has a, a quality um, step in their workflow um, that we plug into and allow these tests to be executed. And then, the results get published to a, um, a dashboard, um, a quick site dashboard here, uh, and people are monitoring their particular uh, data results. Um, and when there's an issue, uh, they can basically go back and say, okay, is the test wrong because negative interest rates are valid or negative oil exists, um, the price of oil less than zero exists, or is the data wrong? But either way, there's an opportunity to fix that uh, and then go back. What, if you're fixing the, the test, you go back and then the dashboard should in turn show that um, uh, you know, the, the validations are now going through. So once again, I, I think the notebook template provided a consistent UI across the entire organization. Um, we created some simple Python um, uh, functions to push the data to the CI CD environment. So we, we actually have a template for this great expectation integration. So people don't have to be experts, they just grab the template, they put the tests in um, and, uh, and they move on. And so an example of folks doing this are dev, ops, uh, BAs. We're in the process of our, um, uh, tra uh, training our BAs on, uh, on this Python and, and great expectations. And once again, this is federated across product groups. Um, so anyone can write these tests and anyone can check them in. Um, and there is a review process um, because when the, when, when the tests get checked in, they go into GitHub and, and so there's a PR review and whatnot. So not anyone can just spam tests in, but anyone has the ability to submit them. And the third one or step five of, um, of, of creating the data lake is, is the data modeling that I talked about. This is where, we, once again, we actually use notebooks. Um, so we have our um, our BAs and content specialists developing the methodology of what the view should look like. Um, so if you remember talking about if there's um, ambiguity and 
uh, you're, you're, you're deciding between equity or, um, or ESG for, um, for, for some equity content, the data that the content specialist is going to say, okay, we're going to go to the equity source to get that data. And, the, and so they will write the documentation and the methodology here. And then the, um, the DBAs or developers can go in and actually write the, the SQL code to retrieve the values. And then they can collaborate on that together and say, okay, yes, the results are what I expect from the methodology. And then similarly to the uh, data um, quality uh, workflow, we have the ability to push these views um, into Git. Uh, and then those views actually propagate their way um, into production. So this, this uh, Jupyter Notebook becomes a living document of both the methodology and the actual view. It is the source code for the view um, that, that we put in here. And so, um, and so we push those out and examples of people using that, I should say we actually use great expectations as well to re, um, to ensure that the results of the model are validating correctly. Um, so we do tie into to great expectations here too. But the examples of, of folks that we've unleashed doing, um, being able to do this are devs, DBAs, our BAs and our content specialists. And once again, this is federated across all our product groups. Um, if people wanna create um, specific, specific products um, uh, views. So here is a summary of scaling through democratization. Um, you can see that this is not just uh, um, hypothetical. We have some really impressive results here. Um, with EtLeap, uh, we took our ET, ETL onboarding from weeks to minutes. Um, we have a total of 1,800 uh, production pipelines, um, and they're growing every day. Um, we're estimating that in the next three years, we'll be at four to 5,000 uh, pipelines. And we have dozens of teams across the organization producing ingestion. In regards to data quality, um, these are a little bit old statistics, but they're still impressive nonetheless. We've got about 7,000 plus tests, and we currently have 1.8 million executions of those tests um, with a 5% failure rate that we are constantly um, uh, assessing. And then on the data modeling, our plan is to have thousands of these views um, and hundreds of BAs scattered across the organization that are, are managing these. So as you can see, uh, you know, the, the, our journey consisted of you know, taking the great people, um, solving the consumption uh, and, uh, and, and centralization challenges through the integrated data solutions in the data lake, uh, and then um, improving the consumption issues through the lake house, and then adding that democratization um, aspect to it. Uh, to, to, to unleash our great people onto these problems. And here is a handful of the technologies that we use for those three. Um, so you can see S3, Glue, Lake Formation, Edleap, Jupiter Lab, Redshift, Great Expectations. And this is a summary of those five steps, which is the centralization, then the consumer friendly aspect of it, and then democratizing it across the organization with three specific examples. So in the end, what we've done is we've created a foundation for research innovation. Uh, we talked about the judiciousness that needed to occur in order to create research. Um, we've removed that friction um, and we are now optimizing data integration at the org level and we are freeing the data, which is our internal mantra um, for, for our group, free the data to the rest of the organization. And I think our most powerful example of that from a, from a business success perspective perspective is our recent um, integration with Sustainalytics. They are using our data lake and this infrastructure to, um, to power uh, their entire product base and to actually propagate all of the Sustainalytics awesome data into Morningstar's um, uh, uh, um, uh, ecosystem as well. So that was something that we uh, went live with uh, about a year ago and, um, and it's been working great uh, and, they, and, and they are sitting on that foundation right now. Um, so that is a summary of the journey. And I think at this point, we're going to open it up to some Q and A. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, we just blocked a couple minutes for questions. So as a reminder, uh, your lines are muted. So keep, keep sending questions in. Um, we're pushing up against time. So real quick, maybe Jeff, um, one question here is, uh, See if I get this. How do Morningstar's different teams interact with the different tools? So 
In other words, uh, are there great expectations users and at leap users distributed uh, throughout the different organizations? Yeah, I would say that the great expectations, um, so most of the at leap usage at this point is on our operations team. Um, and uh, but for teams that want to get onboarded and manage their own pipelines, so we have we have kind of a hybrid model. We have a centralized operations team that can manage pipelines. We also allow products if they want to take complete ownership themselves, then we give them the delegated admin privileges and, and they um, and, and they manage the pipelines um, on their own. So, um, but that is that that is a mutually kind of exclusive task to the great expectations. Um, I think. Uh, um, the great expectations tests are, um, uh, uh, you know, are are, are more, um, I, I would say, uh, BA focused. Um, we've 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 been removed. We've kind of been moving away from a QA model, and developers and BAs do the tests. So that's kind of um, uh, that that's kind of how it's uh, it's it's worked out. It has been a little bit of a um, uh, headwinds because folks that are getting into Jupyter Lab and dealing with code, even though Python is arguably, um, you know, one of the simpler languages out there, there's still um, a hesitation um, and a concern. Um, but we we adopt the the idea that um, that Python and Jupyter Lab is essentially Excel 2.0 for data scientists. That's what we call it, Excel 2.0. And so anyone who is currently using Excel um, to capture business requirements um, in columns. We are saying no, 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 no. That instead of doing that, just put it in the notebook. Um, and the notebook is a live document. Does Excel spreadsheets only as good as the last time they updated it? But the actual notebook is something that propagates to production, and whatever's in there, you can guarantee is live. Excellent. So Thank did you. I answer all of that question? Sorry. Uh, I think so. I uh, might follow up with a questioner on that. Um, I'm going to hold off on the other questions. There'll be content for for a blog or follow-up, but we are we are at time. So that brings us to the end of the webinar. Um, on behalf of that, I really want to thank um, you, Jeff, and the wider Morningstar team for the partnership and sharing it today. Um, obviously, I want to thank Alvin and our great partners at uh, AWS also. So for everyone, please feel free to contact us via the registration uh, or follow-up emails. Uh, and hopefully some of this inspires you to apply some of these lessons uh, and we'd uh, love to talk about that um, and uh, and see where we at least can can help um, and you can uh, as shown here you can request a demo right on at leap.com so thank you everyone and uh, have a great rest of your day thank you